hands of the faith in the Holy Land thought that it would be a very wonderful privilege if they could share some of the experiences that the pilgrims have when they come to the world center, if they could perhaps contribute their own memoirs of their pilgrimages here. And um, all of us have met the beloved guardian. Mr. Furutan came twice as a pilgrim. Mr. Haney came once as a pilgrim. And they received a great deal of inspiration from him. He spoke to them about the holy places and about, of course, many things to do with our faith. And we felt that if some of this could be shared in the form of pictures and description with the Baha'is of the world, that it might be a comfort to those who are not able to come on the pilgrimage and an inspiration in any case to all of the friends in the East and in the West and in the North and in the South. Mr. Furtan came quite early on and had the privilege of being with the beloved guardian and hearing what he had to say about some of the holy places. So I think it'd be very nice if he recounted some of those experiences. Now, my second pilgrimage was in 1954. In that time, the new building of the shrine was completed because, as you know, it was uh, uh, completed in 1953, and I came here for my second pilgrimage in 1954. And the procedure of pilgrimage, um, mostly for Persians and for men, was different from my first pilgrimage. The procedure was that every day we were waiting for the beloved guardian in pilgrim house. And at four o'clock, he used to come by car to the main gate. And when he did come down, we were waiting for him under that eucalyptus tree. It's very close to the main gate. The moment we saw the guardian came in, we wanted uh, not to keep him waiting for us. We used to run and in very quick way go to him. By hand, he stopped us. He said, don't tire yourself. Come quiet, quiet, don't tire yourself. He was so kind to us that he didn't want us even for a second to run and be tired. Then he spoke about the significance of the shrine. He said this shrine, is a new style, badi, he used this badi, he used the verse of the Quran, badi o samawat wal ars, it's new in the earth and in heaven, is the verse of the Quran. It doesn't remember, resemble to the synagogues or to the mosque or to the church, it's quite new style, new style. Then he explained all about the significance of the shrine. And he did so many times that uh, I know now by heart. And of course, you can find most of these things in the writings of him, either in Persian or English that you have. First, he explained about the dome of the shrine in very beautiful way, very smiling lips and the beautiful eyes of the guardian that really I never can describe for you the, the, the beauty of those eyes. Um, I can't go to that and I cannot uh, explain that. I cannot describe you what, uh, what kind of eyes the beloved guardian had and how he looked to you and he smiled to you. It's quite different subject. To me, whoever saw the guardian, he could imagine that. Otherwise, it's very difficult to describe. In such way, he said, the dome, so-called, he said, the golden dome, is beautiful, attractive, and economical. Beautiful, he said, you can see the beauty. No need to explain. It is beautiful. You can see yourself. Attractive, because this attracts people to come here to the shrine and visit the shrine. Because, again, he smiled in such a beautiful way, he said, because they do not realize the spiritual station of the beloved Bab. They are attracting to the golden dome. 
they are coming to see the golden dome. The moment when they are here, the shrine is silent teacher for them. And they understand about the station of the, of the Bab, about the teachings. And economically, he said, look, economically, it's very economical because 12,000 tiles made in Holland, he says, in Utrecht, Holland, cost $10,000. Each tile is less than one dollar. Then he turned to us and said, who could believe in very serious way? Really, I didn't uh, saw the guardian such serious as that evening. He said, who could believe that the remains of the Bob after his martyrdom will, will be brought here to the mountain of God in such beautiful shrine? Who could believe? I think there's one uh, thing that might be added to what Mr. Furitan has said about the shrine. When one approaches the shrine from the side uh, facing Akka and facing the Qibla of the Baha'i world, the shrine of Baha'u'llah, one passes by um, the top of a series of nine terraces that rise from uh, the broad avenue below up to the level of the shrine. Now, when the Guardian completed the last two of those terraces, he sent a very interesting and very um, stirring message to the Baha'i world. And he said that uh, this would in the future be the route by which the pilgrim kings would ascend to pay homage to the martyr prophet of the faith. And he also said that first, before doing that, they would visit the shrine of Baha'u'llah, then they would ascend <clears throat> by this uh, route of the kings, these nine terraces, to pay homage uh, at the shrine of the Bab to the martyr prophet. Well, when I received the joyous news that um, uh, the guardian had extended to me the bounty of a pilgrimage, I was, of course, overjoyed. So eventually I arrived in uh, Haifa. Uh, the guardian was not here the first night. He was in Badji, and so hour by hour went by. The time of my coming in the presence of the beloved guardian came closer and closer, and my trepidation increased hourly because I felt, as every pilgrim must have, certainly they were unworthy to come into the presence of the guardian. In those days, the Western pilgrims uh, had the bounty of uh, having dinner with the beloved guardian. He came to the Western Pilgrim House and he sat with us and talked with us during the meal. So the, um, it was announced, finally the hour came, it was announced that uh, the guardian was awaiting us downstairs. So I uh, was hoping that the other friends living in the pilgrim house would, uh, those serving here, would precede me and I could sort of follow along afterward. And one of them said, oh, no, no, the pilgrims always go first, and gave me a shove down the stairs, and there I was. <laughs> and I came into the presence of the guardian with the trepidation that I mentioned earlier, and he immediately saw and understood everything. And he embraced me, bade me be seated. And from then on, from then on, I felt completely at ease. You know, every Baha'i knows that the guardian was the uh, sign of God on earth, the interpreter of the word of God, the authorized interpreter of the word of God. But he was also uh, the head of the administrative order, the divinely ordained administrative order. And I had an opportunity in those brief hours with him to see how thorough was his grasp of everything and how he followed up everything. At the table each night, he would give instructions to those here serving him. The next night, he would follow up and, and ask for a report, ask if uh, certain things had been done. There was this ceaseless uh, attention. He never just apparently gave an instruction and forgot about it. He followed up on it. And uh, he insisted on, on, on getting all of the facts that would have a bearing on a particular problem and its solution. Um, and I remember once he turned to me and he said, now, 
the National Assemblies also must provide me with the facts, because it is only with correct information and with correct facts at my disposal that I can make the proper decisions. I am always urging the National Assemblies to keep me fully informed. He spoke um, about uh, the decline of religions. He seemed to place a great deal of emphasis on that, and he said that the existing religions are um, constantly becoming more and more political. And he said, that to the extent that this trend continues, and to the extent that they continue to become more political, the more rapid will be their decline, their decline as religious force in the world. He said it's inevitable, and it will happen. My fellow hands have told you what their meetings with the beloved guardian was like, and they have given you a glimpse of how tremendously efficient he was in carrying on the work of the cause. Now you're going to go and make your own pilgrimage. You're going to recapitulate the history of the Baha'i faith in the Holy Land through the places that you visit. And wherever you go, you will see the touch of the guardian of the Baha'i faith and how beautiful he made everything, his sense of history, his sense of proportion, his great desire to give joy to the hearts of all the Baha'is. We are going to begin at the beginning. We're going to begin with the prison city of Akka. In 1868, Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, arrived at Akka in Palestine on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Akka was a heavily protected fortress city where Turkish troops were garrisoned. It was also the worst penal colony in the Turkish Empire. Baha'u'llah was a prisoner of the Sultan of Turkey. Across the Bay of Akka lies Mount Carmel with Haifa at its foot. In those days, people walked or came on horseback from one town to the other along the beach as there was no other road. In the port of Haifa, Baha'u'llah, his family, and some of his followers, about 70 men, women, and children, disembarked from a steamer which had brought them from Turkey and were then taken across the bay in a sailing boat to Akka. Already, Baha'u'llah had suffered 16 years of imprisonment and exile, first in Persia, his native land, then in Iraq and Turkey. For the remaining 24 years of his life, he would be the prisoner of Akka. His sole crime was the extremely liberal, tolerant, and progressive message he taught. For this, he was tortured, put in chains, condemned to death, imprisoned and exiled at the instigation of a fanatical Muslim clergy whose vengeance pursued him for 40 years. In the terrible heat of August, Baha'u'llah disembarked at this sea gate and entered what he described as the most desolate city in the world with a detestable climate and foul water. He was led by his guards through its narrow, stinking lanes. The object of the curiosity and mockery of its inhabitants.
Finally, he arrived at the army barracks and entered this prison. For two years and two months, he and his companions were strictly confined in this inner citadel. Pilgrims who sometimes walked four months from Persia would stand beyond the moats, hoping to glimpse their Lord in the dark windows of the prison. Baha'u'llah suffered more behind those bars than any other time in his life. Almost all the 70 people fell ill with malaria or dysentery. Three died. But the crowning blow for him and his saintly wife, Nabob, the faithful companion of all his exiles, the mother of his most distinguished children, was the death of their 22-year-old son, Mehdi. On the left is Mehdi, called the purest branch by his father. On the right is Abdul Baha, called the master, his eldest son and successor. One evening, walking on the prison roof and meditating, Mehdi fell through an open skylight and died the next day. Baha'u'llah cried out to God, Thou seest me in the hands of mine enemies, and my son blood-stained before thy face. <laughs> The weary years went by. Nine bleak and stormy winters Baha'u'llah spent as a prisoner in Akka.
After the first two terrible years of confinement in the barracks, he and his followers were moved to other buildings. Finally, Baha'u'llah and his family came to live in this house. Gradually, the power of his personality and the beauty of his character won the admiration and friendship of the officials. Although this house is now visited as one building, originally it was two separate houses. Both are now known as the House of Abu. The Guardian built this little garden here, and it was open in those days to the public of Akka one day a week. And they came up and they were absolutely thrilled. They said, there is a house in Akka that has a roof garden. This is the house of Udi Hamar. And this is the room in which Baha'u'llah revealed the Akdas before he moved to the front part of the building, which is called the Beiti Abud. Baha'u'llah arrived in the city of Akka at the end of August, 1868. And by 1871, he was free of his imprisonment in the barracks and he moved to this house with his family. One must remember in looking at this room that this is not the way it was in his days because it was changed when Abdul Baha later lived here after the ascension of Baha'u'llah. As a matter of fact, Abdul Baha used to come and sleep in this room up to practically the very end of his life. It was in this room, which is because of this fact so very sacred to the Baha'is of the world, that Baha'u'llah revealed the kitab i Akdas, which is the charter of the future world order, the future world civilization of Baha'u'llah, and the book that is the repository of his laws and his ordinances. You can see in this room the way Abdul Baha lived. He lived so simply. In the East, the houses were always very crowded. There were many children, there were many retainers, there were many servants, and people did not have special sitting rooms. Now this room, Abdul Baha received his guests in. That's why there's so much furniture in it. And although it was the room in which he slept up till the end of his life, he used to come over here. And when he visited Akka, sometimes he would spend the night and sleep in this bed. This is nevertheless the way he lived when he was in this room. And, and that's why you see that there are these divans and these chairs, and they have not been changed from his days. That is why they have an appearance of having been worn out. You'll also notice that there were no rugs on the floor. There were just these straw mats, and everything was kept very, very simple. That should be a source of great encouragement to the Baha'is in many countries who themselves live under very simple circumstances. Although this is so many years after the passing of Abdul Baha and the days of Baha'u'llah. Nevertheless, this view from this window is very much what they would have seen. And as you can see, you can practically lean over and touch the roof of the neighbors. Through there is the entrance to the upper story of the house of Abud. In this building, really these two buildings, Baha'u'llah was a prisoner for almost seven years. He was a prisoner for over nine years in the city of Akka, and for most of those nine years he lived in these adjoining houses. They are full of very, very touching and historic associations. Down here on the left, where you see that red curtain, is the room which was occupied by Baha'u'llah during the last years in Akka. 
At the end of this corridor is the balcony door which leads to a very beautiful view of the Mediterranean. Baha'u'llah spent the last years of his imprisonment in the city of Akka in this room. It was a very wonderful thing that Abdul Baha could secure this house right on the seaside for Baha'u'llah's use. And this room must have been a tremendous benefit to him in every way because after so many years of imprisonment in this terrible prison, penal colony, Baha'u'llah could be near the sea. The air was better, the view was better, he had light and sunlight, and after the stifling atmosphere of this filthy city of Akka in those days, he was able to come and occupy this very beautiful room by the sea. You can see that uh, we have kept it as much as we know how in the spirit of the furnishings that were here in the days of Baha'u'llah. This was where he used to sit. That is why Shoghi Effendi put here his Taj. He has placed a mark on the wall signifying that he sat here in this corner of the Mandar. These are two of the chairs which were occupied by Baha'u'llah, and he used to receive prominent guests and Baha'is in this room. His bedding, was always kept in this room, and at night he slept on the floor, which was the custom. They didn't have beds in those days. We heard from the history of the days in Akka, written by Shoghi Effendi himself in God Passes By, that a European general came once with the governor of the city of Akka to pay their respects to Baha'u'llah, and that this European general entered the room and remained on his knees during the interview and then withdrew from the presence of Baha'u'llah with the greatest of respect. That probably took place in this very room. This happens to be an unusually beautiful room. You would have a difficulty finding anything comparable to it in this part of the Mediterranean. It was built by a very wealthy man and it's decorated in a very fine style of that period. Baha'u'llah ate alone, and he was served here with the greatest dignity and respect. And these are some of the things that were in use in his days. They were sent by one of the Afnans, who was a merchant in Shanghai. And this was the kind of china that was used for Baha'u'llah's own use and perhaps for very prominent guests or members of the family in his days in Baji and here in this house of Abud. These are also things that were in use by Baha'u'llah. This is the mirror of Baha'u'llah, and this is the room, as I say, that he occupied during the end of his imprisonment in this city for about four years.
This was the room that was occupied by Nawab, the mother of Abdul Baha and the wife of Baha'u'llah. This is the genealogy of Baha'u'llah's family in the writing of the Guardian. You can see that in this room, Shoghi Effendi put so many things associated with the wife of Baha'u'llah, the mother of the master. You see, there is her grave. This is another photograph of her resting place. He put the picture of her sons, Abdul Baha and Mehdi, the purest branch, in this room. This is the room which was occupied by the greatest holy leaf, the daughter of Baha'u'llah and the sister of Abdul Baha, and uh, Shoghi Fendi with the greatest of tenderness and love for this great aunt that he loved so dearly, he put all of these beautiful photographs of her on the wall in her early girlhood, in her maturity, and two pictures of her in her old age. And that not being enough, he put still another picture of her. You can see that there are things associated with her, very beautiful night photograph of her monument, which was uh, constructed after her passing in 1932. Again, one has to remember that this is just for the pilgrims to feel that the place is lived in. It was not like this originally. It was very, very, very much more simple. And all of these things in this hall and all over these holy places that the pilgrims visit were arranged by the guardian to impress them and also the non-Baha'is who visit these places with the importance of the faith, its grandeur, its objectives, its history. Now, this is the testimonial of Queen Mary of Romania, whom you see in this first picture, to the glory of the faith of Baha'u'llah and to what she found in the faith of Baha'u'llah that made her accept him. Over there, on that wall, you have a very unique painting made by Marion Jack, a Canadian who was a painter. And it's taken from the balcony of the mansion of Baha'u'llah, looking towards Akka. And if you look at the minaret up there, you will see that just beyond that is where we are now standing. And this gives the most wonderful view of Haifa, the Bay of Akka, the city of Akka, and the plains between Akka and Baji, which, of course, are all very, very precious uh, places of visitation for the Baha'is of the world. This is the room which was occupied by Abdul Baha. And after Baha'u'llah passed away, this continued to be his room. At that end of the room, there was a long divan, and the master used to sit there after the ascension of Baha'u'llah and uh, spend hours in obviously grief-stricken silence, looking out of the window and grieving for his beloved father, whom, of course, he had this extraordinary tie with, and his agony and his suffering and his loss after Baha'u'llah's ascension or something that we cannot possibly conceive of or appreciate. It was Abdul Baha who ended the bitterest years of his father's captivity. Although the sentence of life imprisonment was never repealed, after almost 10 years, the gate of the prison city was opened to Baha'u'llah. Now, admired by high officials and revered by the populace who called him His Highness and the august leader, he was at last free to move about the countryside. Near Akka was a beautiful garden on an island in the river. Abdu'l-Bahá rented this for Baha'u'lláh, who called it Rizvan, 
which means paradise, surely a paradise for the man, now over 60, who still bore the marks of the chains he wore four months in a dungeon in Tehran. He used to rest in this small house when he came here. It has not changed much since this old photograph was taken at the beginning of the century. His bedding, wrapped up and placed here on this table, is original, but other things have been added in later years. Under the shade of mulberry trees surrounded by the river, this beautiful spot now became one of Baha'u'llah's favorite retreats. On these benches, carefully preserved as shown in this old photograph, he would sit, dictating letters to his secretary or receiving pilgrims and guests. In Akka, he once told Abdul Baha, the country is the world of the soul, the city, the world of bodies. Although the Garden of Rizwan was frequently visited, it was here, in the heart of the countryside, some kilometers north of Akka, that Baha'u'llah now lived at Mazra'e. Again, we have an old photograph of how this house appeared in his days. Those are the windows of his room. This is the room that Baha'u'llah occupied in the two years that he used to live here in Mazra'e after he was freed from his strict imprisonment in the city of Akka and before he moved to live in the mansion at Baji where he passed away. Again, none of these things are original. The room is original and untouched, but it was furnished by the guardian so that the pilgrims could come and have the blessing of visiting another room that was occupied during Baha'u'llah's days by himself. On dusty paths through the wilderness, Baha'u'llah sometimes moved about by carriage or riding a donkey. Though a prisoner until he died, the years of strict confinement were over. As Abdul Baha said, if his light before the days in Akka was like a star, there it became like a mighty sun. Abdul Baha at last succeeded in acquiring a worthy residence for his father, the beautiful Oriental Palace at Baji. This old photograph shows how it must have looked in those days. At this stoop, Baha'u'llah used to mount his donkey. It has been carefully preserved by Shoghi Effendi. About 1880, Baha'u'llah came to live here in what he called his lofty mansion. occupied that corner room. His beloved son had brought him here where he found a measure of peace during the last 12 years of his life, weary from over 30 years of perpetual persecution, imprisonment, and exile.
It was in this corner that Baha'u'llah used to sit, and it was in this position that Professor Brown of Cambridge University had the honor of being received by him. We have some very, very precious relics of Baha'u'llah. They are things which are of great historic interest, and they mean a great deal to us because they are the actual things that he used. This is his Taj, which was the hat which he wore all the end of his life, and a white turban would have been wound around it. We have something here which is infinitely precious. We have some of the locks of the hair of Baha'u'llah, which his daughter, the sister of Abdul Baha, the greatest holy leaf, used to take hair by hair from his comb and make into locks that resembled the beauty and luxuriance of his hair. I personally think that this is one of the most touching things that we have the privilege of seeing in the Baha'i world, that we can actually see these gorgeous sort of living, wonderful hair of Baha'u'llah. We have another thing here which is infinitely precious, and that is a string of his prayer beads. And he, of course, he used many, many prayer beads. And this is one which was given to Miss Martha Root by an old Baha'i in Persia, and Martha Root gave it to my mother, and my mother gave it to me. It's an infinitely precious thing for anybody to be privileged to see. Of course, eventually it will go into some archives. Then we have here the socks of Baha'u'llah. You can see how small his feet were. He was very short in stature. We have the Arachin, which he wore at night. We have one of his shirts. As you can see, it is made of hand-woven cloth. We must remember that this is almost 100 years ago that things like this were in use. Here we have one of the Abbas of Baha'u'llah made of camel hair woven on the hand looms of Persia. And here we have something which is of infinite significance and importance, and that is the hidden words, some of the original hidden words in the handwriting of Baha'u'llah himself. He had very, very beautiful penmanship, and it is infinitely precious to think that these wonderful words of wisdom, we are able to see how they were written by his hand in the original. Then we have the fur coat that was used by Baha'u'llah. There were no heating facilities in these bent buildings. It must have been bitterly cold, and he must have also felt the cold very much. This is the room in which Professor E.G. Brown of Cambridge University in April 1890 had a very important interview and a very unique interview with Baha'u'llah. He describes him in this way. He says, the face of him on whom I gazed, I can never forget, though I cannot describe it. Those piercing eyes seem to read one's very soul. Power and authority sat on that ample brow. The jet black hair and beard flowing down in indistinguishable luxuriance, almost to the waist. I bowed myself before one who was the object of a devotion which kings might envy and emperors sigh for in vain. A mild, dignified voice bade me be seated. Praise be to God that thou hast attained. Thou hast come to see a prisoner and an exile. We desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations, yet they deem us a stirrer up of strife and sedition worthy of bondage and banishment. That all nations should be one in faith and all men as brothers, that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened, that diversity of religion should cease and differences of race be annulled, what harm is there in this? Yet so it shall be. 
These fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away, and the most great peace shall come. It was in this room that Baha'u'llah passed away on May the 29th, 1892. And before he died, he called his family and his followers together, and he said, I am well pleased with you all. The gentleness, the loving kindness of Baha'u'llah, his patience, are indescribable. Not only his teachings are so marvelous and will change the whole life of men on this planet, but his love and his tenderness are unbelievable. And I think you feel him closer in this room than in any other place in the Holy Land. It's as if you could, well, almost touch the, the hem of his robe and almost see him and hear his voice when you come into this very precious room. This is the room that was occupied by the beloved guardian when he used to come over and spend the night in Badji, which he did quite often when he was making the gardens and beautifying the whole property here. That is the bed that he occupied. Above the bed is the genealogy of Baha'u'llah, all in his own handwriting. Above that is one of the early designs for the first Mashak Allah's car in the West, which happens to have been done by W.S. Maxwell, the hand of the cause, who designed the uh, superstructure of the shrine of the Bab. And Shoghi Fendi placed this original design of his here in this position. Above that are two of the beautiful birds of paradise of Meshkin Ghalam, and in this whole room, you see things that are of great historic interest. On that side of the wall is a picture of the greatest holy leaf drawn from life by a very well-known American portrait painter, Daisy Smythe. This is the picture of Abdul Baha in his youth, and it was taken at the same time as the only photograph that we have of Baha'u'llah. It was taken in Adrianople before he left on the final stage of his imprisonments and exiles to uh, come to the Holy Land. You see, this room of Shoghi Effendi, which he used to sleep in when he came over to the mansion, is exactly opposite the room of Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah's room is in the eastern corner, and Shoghi Effendi's room is in the western corner of the mansion. When the guardian came over here, he did something that I think will be great comfort to many people who live simply. He used to tell me, I'm going to Badji to spend the night. And he would walk out of the house with his toothbrush in his pocket and get into his automobile and come over here. And sometimes he stayed here as long as four or five days. And it was just as simple as that. This hall of the mansion is one of the most beautiful parts of this building, which is in itself unique architecturally in this part of the Middle East. And the Guardian put very many wonderful things here on exhibition to add to its charm and its dignity. It became a sort of a little Baha'i museum. These are very, very precious relics of the past. Shoghi Fendi placed the two headstones of the graves of Baha'u'llah's wife, the mother of Abdul Baha, and of Baha'u'llah's beloved son, the purest branch who was killed through falling through the skylight on the roof of the prison of Akka during the two-year period Baha'u'llah was imprisoned there. And Shoghi Fendi exhumed their bodies. Later on, we will be able 
to visit their monuments in Haifa and see with what glory they finally came to rest on Mount Carmel. But when he exhumed their bodies prior to removing their remains to Mount Carmel, he had these things put here as of historic and precious interest to the Baha'is. So we have these two headstones. Then we have something very wonderful and very touching. We have the coffin in which the mother of Abdul Baha had been laid to rest in the cemetery outside Akka. When Shogi Effendi, with his own hands, went to exhume these precious remains, he got into the graves and himself took them out and placed them in new coffins with the greatest of respect and brought them to Haifa in the vicinity of the shrine of the Bab on Mount Carmel prior to their interment in the garden close to the remains of the greatest holy leaf, Bahia Khan. On this wall, we have a picture of one of the martyrs of the Babi times, in other words, the killing of one of the Baha'is in the period of the Bab published in a Russian book. On this wall, below this bookcase that has a great many Braille translations of the Baha'i writings, we have the famous Mesquito Mosque in Cordoba, Spain. Over here, we have the holy city of Jerusalem. This was to show how sacred this city is in the eyes of the Baha'is and also in the eyes of the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians. This is a very interesting thing that the Guardian has done here. He has placed the Faramon the order for the execution of the Bab on this wall, and below it he has put the commanding officer of the regiment that actually fired the shot and killed the Bab. And then, opposite this, deliberately, the Guardian conceived the idea of placing the first local spiritual assemblies of Latin America, assembly by assembly. And he was very, very happy over their formation. It was part of the first seven-year plan. And he said that this commanding officer could look at the result of his work, what had come about from the execution of the Baal. Aside from the pictures of the Baha'i Temple in Wilmette in the United States, on this wall there's something again that calls to our attention the fact that the Baha'is believe in all the sacred religions of the world and respect them, because this is a very important place in the Baha'i world, a place of pilgrimage. Now, Shoghi Fendi, the guardian, placed on the wall a picture of the holy city of Medina, and on the left, the Kaaba in Mecca, the place of pilgrimage for all the Muslims in the world. And he put here, the Shrine of the Bob, with its architect, W.S. Maxwell, a Canadian Baha'i. He had this beautiful early photograph of the monument of the greatest holy leaf. And the rest of the room, as you can see, was very beautifully decorated, and this was the actual style of the building in the days when it was purchased for Baha'u'llah towards the end of his life. Baha'u'llah's room opened onto this secluded court on the balcony where he could enjoy privacy. The colored glass screen and marble fountain made it cool and shady in summer and protected from the rain in winter. Below it is one of the loveliest gardens in Baji. After Baha'u'llah's passing, the mansion was occupied for many years by other relatives, and Abdul Baha rented a small house near his tomb. 
For 16 years after his father's death, Abdul Baha continued to be a prisoner in Akka. When the officials were friendly, he had more freedom. Often he stayed here in Baji, where he received many pilgrims. From the age of nine, when he went to the dungeon in Tehran to ask if his father was still alive, he shared all the suffering and injustice heaped upon Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha's love for his fellow men never wavered. In Akka, he became known as the father of the poor. This simple room brings him very close to us. The coffee set used to serve his guests. His own binoculars. His tea things. The successor of Baha'u'llah was like a stainless mirror that reflected his light to perfection. Abdul Baha buried Baha'u'llah in a vault beneath the floor of one of the houses adjacent to the mansion. These early photographs show the original appearance of the shrine and how Abdul Baha reinforced the corner room, which is the tomb. With his own hands, he used to water this little garden beside his father's grave. Except for the mansion and the few houses clustered about it, Baji in those days was surrounded by fields. In that inner chamber, Abdul Baha reverently placed his father's remains in 1892. The beautification of this holy spot was carried out by his successor, Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith. It was he who built this majestic entrance to the shrine and called it the Collins Gate. embellished it by erecting this simple but dignified portico and placing above it the symbol of the greatest name, an invocation to God often used by Baha'is, which says, O thou glory of the most glorious. A simple beauty surrounds Baha'u'llah's resting place. From it, an almost tangible sense of peace flows out. His words echo in our ears. We desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations. The happiness of the nations. This lofty mansion where Baha'u'llah dwelt was always a unique building from the architectural standpoint. It was completed in 1870, passed out of our hands for many years, and was painstakingly restored to its original glory by Shoghi Effendi. In the old days, this was the side door of the mansion and probably seldom, if ever, used by Baha'u'llah. The 
decorations over the windows on the balcony are all the original designs and have a charm of their own. No doubt some simple artisan used his imagination and filled each space with his own fantasy. Everything that Shoghi Effendi developed here has to be seen on the background of what it used to look like. This was raw countryside. Until 1952, when Shoghi Effendi succeeded in acquiring 150,000 square meters of land surrounding the tomb of Baha'u'llah, very few changes had taken place since the time of his passing. In this little white room, Shoghi Effendi used to sit and answer his letters while the gardens in front of the shrine were being developed. In order to better survey the work from a height, he built that little staircase to the roof. Now, the whole concept of the guardian was to pay respect to the resting place of the supreme manifestation of God, Baha'u'llah. And this is the point of adoration of the whole Baha'i world. He wanted to make a giant circular garden around this resting place. And he had very rough territory to begin with. So he hired a bulldozer. And he came over here and he began to tell the people uh, the workers and those who were running the bulldozers, that they should come and push all of this earth away from this triangular-shaped garden to the left of the entrance of the Shrine of Baha'u'llah and begin to flatten it out so he could make a very beautiful garden. As this took place, all this earth was gradually pushed up at this end, and it formed an embankment along here, this first terrace that you see, became an embankment of the earth that the bulldozer had pushed up. And then the guardian came and he stood up there and he found that although it was a very slight elevation, it enabled him to survey what he was doing here very much better and to direct the operations from an advantage point. Then he went on flattening this whole area, pushing the earth all in this direction and he built the second terrace. And the higher he went, the greater the beauty of his garden became. Then he built that third terrace, which was completed after his passing in 1957. The whole uh, originality of these gardens is entirely due to Shoghi Effendi. He received no advice from architects, from landscape gardeners, from gardeners, from anybody. It was entirely his own sense of proportion which was perfect and which one sees in his elaboration of the Baha'i administration and the world order of Baha'u'llah in his writings and he received no help from gardeners he had nothing but very ordinary farm labor who did the gardening work here he had no qualified gardeners whatsoever This is one of the most fascinating sections of our gardens anywhere in Badji or in Haifa. It looks very much like a beautiful oriental rug. There was, before the guardian passed away, a very large two-story building which blocked off all this end of the garden. 
And Shogi Fendi did a most extraordinary thing. He made that garden uh, to a point about two-thirds of the way towards us and planted it and designed it and he passed away. He didn't ever come back to the Holy Land to finish this garden himself or to supervise the demolition of that building. The hands of the faith, after his passing, had this building torn down according to his wishes. And then we wanted to complete the development of this section of the garden. We found that taking this wall, which already existed, that that garden with all of those pom-poms of hedges and the circles and the lamp posts and that great big oblong with cactus plants and aloe plants in it could be completed right up to the wall within one span of measurement that was accurate. It was as if there had been a rug that had been rolled up just to this point and all we had to do was just to continue to unroll the design of that rug, in other words, that section of the garden, till it came to this wall. It was almost magical the way it worked out. Universal House of Justice, the supreme body of the Baha'i faith, built this new entrance for the convenience of the thousands of tourists and Baha'is visiting Baji. For these Baha'i pilgrims, it is the fulfillment of their heart's desire, a spiritual communion that will change their entire lives. <laughs>
On clear nights from the balcony of the mansion, the Bob Shrine can be seen across the bay in Haifa, glowing like a mighty jewel on Mount Carmel. When he was a prisoner of the Persian government in Maku, he was denied even a lamp. Shoghi Effendi said, to compensate for this, we drown him in a sea of light every night. The Bab, who was the forerunner of Baha'u'llah, was not yet 31 years old when he was martyred in 1850 because of his liberal teachings. The story of how he came to rest here began when Baha'u'llah, on a visit to Haifa, told Abdul Baha to bring the Bab's body from Persia and bury it here. In 1899, it arrived secretly in Akka, and Abdul Baha immediately set about constructing this tomb. He planned to bury the Bob's body in the center of nine rooms, but during this period, he was again strictly confined to Akka and could build only six. Every stone of that building, Abdul Baha wrote, I have with infinite tears raised and placed in position. After Abdul Baha's passing, Shoghi Effendi added the three other rooms, thus completing the original concept of the master. In 1909, free after 40 years imprisonment in Akka, Abdul Baha placed the Bab's body within these walls. Casting off his shoes, cloak, and turban, his silvery hair waving about his luminous face, he bent over the coffin and wept as if his heart would break. The history of this shrine is unique. The prophet Isaiah called Carmel the mountain of the Lord, to which all nations will flow. Its site was chosen by Baha'u'llah. Its style was planned by Abdul Baha, who said that when completed, it must have a colonnade and dome. The model of the building was displayed by Shoghi Effendi in 1944 on the first centenary of the Baha'i faith. Please. 
In the upper garden behind the shrine, there still stands the circle of cypress trees, which mark the spot where Baha'u'llah once sat and instructed Abdul Baha to purchase this land and build the Bab's tomb here. Shoghi Fendi told its architect that the shrine should be neither occidental nor oriental in style. The crown-like rim of the dome, however, shows strong Indian influence. The 18 windows in the drum symbolize the 18 disciples of the Bab. Shoghi Fendi had a unique eye for both beauty and proportion. These finials on the clerestory section of the shrine owe both their charm and originality to him, who repeatedly encouraged the architect to make them taller. Their collaboration was a happy one. Because the Bab was a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, he was entitled to wear green. At Shoghi Fendi's request, this band of green was introduced into the design of the shrine to denote the Bab's illustrious lineage and the flecks of red to symbolize the blood he shed as a martyr. A singularly gentle and pious youth, he was in his 30th year when he was killed. Of the six years of his religious ministry, over half were spent in dismal prisons in the north of Persia. This beautiful tomb is worthy of that life and death. From the main entrance to the shrine gardens, we cross one of Haifa's busiest streets to reach the gate of what is called the Monuments Garden where Baha'u'llah's daughter, Bahia Khanum, is buried in what is surely one of the most unique cemeteries in the world. This is the resting place of the greatest holy leaf, the sister of Abdul Baha and the daughter of Baha'u'llah. Shoghi Fendi said that she was endowed from birth with meekness and fortitude. He said something so beautiful about her character that I would like to read it. He said her sleepless vigilance, her tact, her courtesy, her extreme patience and heroic fortitude. In many, many places in the writings of Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha and the Guardian, there are these wonderful testimonials to the greatness of the station of the greatest holy leaf. She passed away in 1932, and the guardian was not present, and he specified that she should be buried here on Mount Carmel. And he ordered for her this perfectly exquisite marble monument, which was made in Carrara, and which he literally, you might say, designed himself. He told the architect exactly what he wanted. Shoghi Fendi said often to the pilgrims that this was like the administrative order. You could take it as a symbol of the administrative order because you had the foundations of it, which are the believers and the local spiritual assemblies. Those are the steps, the pillars, are the national Baha'i assemblies of the world that are the foundations holding up that dome. And that the dome was like the universal house of justice. And he considered that this was an emblem in a way of the administrative order. This, to me, has always been a love temple. I consider it the embodiment of the love that the guardian had for the greatest holy leaf. She, next to Abdul Baha, was the great mainstay of his life and the greatest influence in his life and had the most profound effect on the Baha'i world, really from the very beginning of the faith in Baghdad to the very end of her life in 1932. But the Baha'is don't perhaps realize it yet. But gradually, her stature 
will rise and they will come to appreciate her supreme role in the teachings of Baha'u'llah and in the faith and the order of Baha'u'llah. All of these gardens and paths were laid out by Shoghi Fendi himself. He stood here, he planned it, he had it done in front of his eyes, he designed it from beginning to end. And this is the unique charm of these places. This is the resting place of the wife of Baha'u'llah. As Shoghi Effendi said, the famed Nawab, a woman of extraordinary piety and holiness and gentleness and a very great lady in her own right from her background. She was the support of her family and her history is most moving. Next to her is the grave of the purest branch, who, as the friends will recall, fell from the roof of the fortress of Akka, where Baha'u'llah and his family were imprisoned and was very seriously injured. And after 20 hours, he passed away. His father asked him what he wanted, and he said, I want the believers to be able to come and visit their Lord. You know, the greatest holy leaf always said, I want to be buried next to my mother. And she was buried in a cemetery that was very unworthy and unbefitting. And the guardian, instead of trying to do the impossible and the undesirable and removed the greatest holy leaf to be near her mother, he removed her mother to be near her. And he brought her beloved mother, put her in all this glory on Mount Carmel, the son of Baha'u'llah here. These two monuments here, which as you see, are very similar in style to the other one of the greatest holy leaf. And the greatest holy leaf's monument up at the other end of this path form that axis upon which the center point is the direction of the seat of the Universal House of Justice. And the Universal House of Justice, as you know, is part of these wonderful buildings and institutions that will be erected in the future. The Guardian made the International Archives. There will be the institution for the teaching and protection of the faith. There will be an institution for the holy writings. And as I understand it, there will also be an uh, international library. And these great administrative buildings will all be up there. And these holy souls will be the center of those institutions. It is difficult to associate a place like this with death, as most people understand it, or to remember these lovely monuments are actually tombs, like this one over the grave of Abdul Baha's wife.
people asked Shoghi Fendi why he had chosen the Greek style of architecture. And he said that it was because for 2,000 years it had been pleasing to people that they had considered it beautiful unfailingly for 2,000 years. And that if he chose a modern style, he had no way of knowing how long it would be acceptable to people at all. Because, of course, it changes all the time. 20, 50 years later, it might look perfectly hideous to a new generation of people. And this whole arc was laid out and planned to be in the style of Greek architecture. The extraordinary thing about the construction of this International Archives building, which houses the relics of the faith and the tablets and things of historic interest, is that the Guardian built the garden first out here, and he said you can bring the building in from the back. So a road was constructed back there, just contrary to what any other human being on the, in the world would have done. And we built this building into the garden, which he had already landscaped and prepared, so that when the building was completed, the garden was already partially grown. And he had the joy of seeing that before he passed away. Shoghi Effendi chose a famous Greek temple as model for the archives building with its ionic capitals. The seat of the Universal House of Justice is also in the Greek style, but adapted to the needs of a modern building. In this case, the predominant order is Corinthian, as shown in these beautiful capitals on top of the 58 columns of the building. At the foot of Mount Carmel, in what was once the old city of Haifa, lies Abdul Baha's house on Persian Street, so called because originally most of the Baha'is who were Persians lived here. When the Universal House of Justice was elected in 1963, this building, which was once the Western Baha'i Pilgrim House, became its temporary office, pending the completion of a permanent headquarters on Mount Carmel. Across the street is the home of Abdul Baha. The brass plaque bearing his name in Arabic still remains on the entrance gate. This large house was not only his residence, but many members of his family also lived here. Abdul Baha's bedroom was on the sunny side of the house, behind these windows. The upper story is the apartment of Shoghi Effendi added to the house as an office and living quarters of his own. That little room was sometimes used by Abdul Baha. We even have this old photograph showing him up there. This is the main entrance of the home of Abdul Baha, which was completed in about 1908. And during the following two years, he and the members of his family moved over here. This marked the end of his long imprisonment in the city of Akka. And this is a scene of the ministry of Shoghi Effendi, the eldest grandson of Abdul Baha and his successor, who was guardian of the Baha'i faith for 36 years, and he lived in this house, and all of his services to the Baha'i world took place in this house. Both of them received their guests in this very historic sitting room from the old days. This is undoubtedly one of the most historic rooms that we have in the Baha'i holy places in the Holy Land. And in this sitting room, Abdul Baha received many very prominent guests. 
he received General Allenby, who was responsible after World War I for Abdul Baha receiving a knighthood from the British government. He received the King of Iraq, King Faisal of Iraq. Abdul Baha always sat in that corner of that particular sofa. And Shoghi Effendi, during his whole lifetime, refused to sit higher up in this room than had been the position of his beloved grandfather, the master. And he always sat in that corner of that sofa. Nobody ever of the master or the guardian sat higher than those two places. But they always invited their prominent guests, and if the room was full of guests, all of the guests, to always come higher, so that anybody like the president of the state of Israel or Lord Samuel, whoever it might be, was always invited to occupy the upper seats because those were the seats of honor. And then, of course, the guests of the guardian were here. Shoghi Fendi also received, as had Abdul Baha, a great many pilgrims in this room. This was the room that many of the pilgrims have amongst the deepest associations with Shoghi Fendi. There's a very lovely story about this room. The greatest holy leaf went to Beirut, and she bought this furniture, this whole suite of furniture, for the reception room of her beloved brother, Abdul Baha. And then, finally, there were very few rugs on the property in those days. This rug was placed here in this room. And Abdul Baha, as you know, was very generous. He used to like to give things to prominent people and give things to very poor people, including often the coat off his back. And so a day came when he wanted to give this very beautiful rug, which was really the only valuable rug in the possession of Abdul Baha's family in those days, and which was the rug in his reception room away. And uh, Shoghi Fendi told me the greatest holy leaf came and she stood here. And she said, please, Abdul Baha, not this rug. Just please leave this for your sitting room because how will you entertain your guests if you haven't even got a rug on the floor? The table in the middle of the room is from his days but a part of the other furnishings are from the days of Shoghi Effendi. And as I said, this room has many very precious associations with the lifetime of the master and the lifetime of the guardian. This is the hall of Abdul Baha's house, and in the old days, he used to sit with some of his guests, Europeans, that he would invite for lunch around this table. This is the bedroom of Abdul Baha, and uh, Shoghi Effendi placed these curtains here and distinguished it from every other room in the house out of respect. And this is the place where the guardian used to sleep and work as a young man. People come here and have the privilege of visiting the room in which the master passed away in 1921. This is the bed that he occupied, the bed in which he passed away. This is the chaise long, which he used to often rest on instead of uh, resting in his bed, his table, with the things that were there in his own lifetime. He always sat over in that corner. And uh, he used to receive many of his guests and many of the pilgrims in this room rather than the sitting room. He had a constant stream of visitors and many of them would have been received and seen in this room.
From the days when Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha arrived in Akka in a sailing boat as prisoners, to these days when the shrine on Mount Carmel is visited by tens of thousands of tourists each year from all over the world, is indeed a miraculous change in the fortunes of a persecuted faith. The Baha'i Shrine is included in most tours. During the three hours every morning when it is open to the public, often over 3,000 people visit it. Photographs are not permitted inside the shrines because they are sacred tombs. But everyone enjoys taking pictures outside as souvenirs of their visit. Before Baha'u'llah died, many people came from the east to meet him. In Abdul Baha's days, many more came from east and west. In Shoghi Fendi's days, the numbers greatly increased. Now thousands of pilgrims pour in from every country, every background, every race. They gather here in what was the Oriental Baha'i Pilgrim House. Often they are accompanied on their first visit to the shrine by a hand of the faith. Mr. Furtan describes to the Persian-speaking friends some of the moving events associated with the Shrine of the Bab. Having many times had the opportunity, when he himself was a pilgrim, of walking on these paths with Shoghi Effendi and hearing him speak about its history and its construction, Mr. Furtan is able to share some of these precious recollections with the Baha'is. It is a custom to remove one's shoes, but there are no rituals or ceremonies in the Baha'i faith. People are expected to show respect for holy places, but the pilgrims who have at last attained their goal are full of reverence as they file into the shrine of the Bab. After their prayers in the shrine of the martyred forerunner of Baha'u'llah, the pilgrims visit the tomb of Abdul Baha adjacent to that of the Bab.
what was done by the hand of the faith Mr. Furtan for the benefit of the Persian-speaking friends is now repeated for the benefit of the English-speaking friends by the hand of the faith Mr. Haney. The important event is to visit the shrines. To be able to do this with one of the old Baha'is who knew the guardian is an added privilege. No services are ever held here. They are places of worship only, where individuals recite prayers out loud or commune silently, each according to his own feelings and customs. Shoghi Fendi said the view from Haifa is the best in the world because it combines the sea, the plains, and the mountains. In future, people will approach the shrine up these terraces. This obelisk was chosen by Shoghi Fendi to mark the spot of the future Baha'i temple on the top of Mount Carmel overlooking the sea. The pilgrims are reminded that Baha'i houses of worship are open to all. As there are no priests in our faith, no sermons are preached. Instead, words from the sacred scriptures of all revealed religions are read. With absorbed interest, the pilgrims listen to the history of the members of Baha'u'llah's family buried here on Mount Carmel. What greater belief in immortality than this, the tomb should be the center of a pulsating, dynamic, worldwide administration. The pilgrims come to Abdul Baha's home where for so many years he received friend and stranger alike with his unfailing love and kindness. Respectfully, they visit the room he died in and quietly leave full of memories of both Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi. The visit to the International Baha'i Archives is another memorable experience for the pilgrims. They cross the street from the Shrine Gardens and walk up the path opposite towards this private Baha'i Museum. Here they will see many of the original writings of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, and Abdul Baha in their own hand, as well as things associated with them personally and the early history of the faith. It takes over two hours to visit the archives. The pilgrims come out somewhat overwhelmed by all they have seen and look up at the Universal House of Justice building towering above them on Mount Carmel. It's a very 
wonderful thing to think that after the pilgrimage, the Baha'is end up looking towards the future in the building that is the seat of the Universal House of Justice. And all the bounties will flow from this wonderful place to all mankind. When the beloved guardian spoke to the pilgrims about the future of the Universal House of Justice, really I couldn't imagine that it will happen so soon. And now this is 17 years I'm in the Holy Land and I have this pleasure to serve the House of Justice and I am sure the next generations they will appreciate more and more. And I always give thanks to Baha'u'llah that I had this privilege and now in such grandiose, in such majestic building of the city of the House of Justice, I am as eyewitness to see this majesty and this glory. I recall the many things the beloved guardian said about uh, this building and this institution, uh, that it would adorn God's new world order with a crown of majestic proportions, and that from this building and from this institution, there would flow into the world rivers of laws and ordinances for the guidance of mankind, and that when the future establishment of these institutions is completed, it would mark the inception of the kingdom of God on earth and the establishment of the sovereignty of Baha'u'llah in the world. Beautiful.